goalless anymore like the first century church. They didn't have AC back then. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys. If you want to go outside, it might be cooler. <laughs> I promise you I'll put it back on the schedule. <laughs> so I'll do. I'll just take the speakers outside and take the mic and just yell from the van. So, all right. So let's uh, let's open up in a word of prayer. Um, you guys, do remember Kevin in prayer tonight? Um, I'm Kevin and Donna. I remember them in prayer. Uh, we closed Friday morning. Thank God that'll be over. Um, baby shower Saturday, so keep praying for her. They scheduled her C-section for June 30th, so that's the pray that we make that date, um, that we can get there, and that she will not be able to do it. And um, I'm missing some of them. Listen, Carl's daughter and uh, his son. Please pray for them. We'll pray for them tonight. And you got one? Or was that just a put in your hand? Okay. I'm sorry. No prayer requests. You've already taken to the Lord. Fantastic. We'll uh, shorten our time of prayer tonight. Anthony has already had here. So uh, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Let's just ask him to, uh, to move in our favor. Heavenly Father God, we thank you tonight. God, we praise you tonight, Lord. We, we come before you, Lord, humble, and we come before you, God, knowing that when we bring our requests to you, God, that you hear them, you begin to move on them, you're already working in them. And God, I can't wait to see the outcome for each one of these situations, God, because I know that when we bring things to you, God, your glory comes forth and your hand of mercy and grace is extended to each situation. So, God, I pray tonight, first and foremost, for Kevin and, and for, for Donna. I pray, God, for their situation, for Phoebe and for Bridget, Lord, the whole family, God, for the warfare they're going through tonight, that you would reach down and touch them. I pray that you bring peace and, and comfort to every single bit of that situation, God, and just begin to move in their midst, oh Lord. God, I pray tonight for Carl's son and, and his daughter, God, and I pray that, that what they're going through, God, what they're facing on a day-to-day -day basis, Lord, the, the desires of Carl's heart to, for them to come to you and to know you and to serve you, God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would tug at their heartstrings, that you would send people, God, to just meet them where they are and just minister to their needs, God, and to just pour out your spirit upon them, Lord. We thank you so much for that, God, and I trust you and I I put that in your hands, and I praise you that the Holy Spirit is watching over that whole situation with all those lives, God, and we thank you for it. And God, I pray for our church body tonight, and I pray for our church family tonight, I pray for those that are here tonight, and those that couldn't make it tonight, and for all that you're doing, Lord, and I praise you, and I thank you for it. And I ask tonight, God, that you would minister your word to us, God, that you would just show us new things, God, and, and teach us, Lord, and open our hearts and our minds to receive your glory, God, and receive your word. And God, I give you honor and glory tonight, and I praise you. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. So, if you guys want to turn with me tonight in your Bibles, we're going to go back to Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. We're going to talk about the discipleship. Uh, we're kind of we're going to pick up where we left off last week, and I, I want to I want to try to drop on tonight uh, discipleship because um, we're now in a season in which we are ready to make these disciples and then set these disciples forth. And that means you guys are the disciples that we're making and creating, and God is working and moving. And we're going to discuss that a little bit more tonight. So Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20 is where I'm going to reference tonight. And that's going to be my foundational scripture as we dive into discipleship and what it means to be a disciple. Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. When you get there, shout Amen. Amen. Is that how you do, you do? You shout at your kids at that level. That's a shout. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. So good to have Christina back. Super excited about what you were able to do this past Sunday. We certainly missed you, and um, but uh, but proud of you. And uh, man, I can't wait to I can't wait to hear some testimonies come out of that what you shared. So, um, but Matthew chapter twenty eight verses sixteen through twenty says. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. 
Who remembers last week what it means to be a disciple? Does anybody remember what it means to be a disciple? To teach others what? The word. The word? All right. And so once we teach others with the word, what are we to do with that? What are we to help them to do? So we teach them the word. Lead them in the faith. Lead them in the faith, right? So when we teach them the word, we help lead them in the faith. What else are we supposed to do with the word of God when we're helping them become disciples? Show them love. Show them. So ultimately, with, with creating new disciples, one of the responsibilities that I have for you in discipleship is I need to teach you the word. I need to help lead you in your faith. But I need to help take this and make it applicable to your life so that then you can take it and apply it to someone's life out there. Okay? It's great that we understand and we read the word of God, but we also have to be able to apply it to everything that we do and everyone that we encounter, right? I was having a conversation today with Jamie, and, uh, and I told him that he needs to come home. He's been gone for long enough and we'll come back to New York. Um, but we were having a conversation today about how Jesus built foundational relationships and how there was a time for teaching the word, but there was also, if you look at how Jesus taught them, he taught them through parables, he taught them through stories, he taught them through life-relevant um, life events, okay? Today, if I wanted to teach somebody that this is a piano, I could talk them through this and I could walk them through this because this is relevant today. This is something that's used in a church is relevant today. Jesus wouldn't have been teaching about a piano back in those days because it didn't exist. So Jesus took things of the society and of that time and he made them relevant to the people. Okay? That's like if you if 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 Carl wanted to teach me how to make cabinets, because I know Carl used to make cabinets, right? He's not gonna bring a shovel and glue and start teaching me how to make cabinets. He's going to bring the things that are relative to building and making cabinets so that he can then teach me by giving me the proper tools. And that's exactly what the Word of God is. If we want to make disciples of Christ, we've got to bring the relevant tools to the people. Okay. Now, what I mean by that is, I'm not going to ask Christina to go run out to somebody who has never even heard about Jesus and start talking about things in the book of Revelation. Okay. We're not going to do that. Anthony, you and I aren't going to sit down and have a conversation about prophecy the first time I meet you. Now that I've met you, as we go along in our relationship, I'll know how to talk to you and what, I can, what we can discuss because it can be overwhelming. Anybody had somebody talk about the Word of God to you and you just felt totally overwhelmed? I remember sitting at the table with my father-in-law that first night when they were talking about the Holy Spirit, and I had no clue what that was. Like, that was just way over my head. I experienced it that next morning, so what he told me the night before, it then it started to become more relevant. But I'm not going to sit down and have a talk with somebody about the book of Revelation that just got saved. I'm going to start in Genesis. And I'm going to walk them through Genesis and how the Lord created everything that we see. And then I'm probably going to move to the Gospels because I want to tell them about the life of Jesus Christ because now they need to know how to walk. So when we go out and we are making disciples, once we become disciples of Christ and we make disciples, we need to be relevant to them. Okay? And Jesus was great at that. Jesus was a carpenter. That was one of the most common things back then. You had carpenters, you had farmers. Most people back then were nomadic, so they moved around a lot. So that's why you see the way that Jesus went at people is he found ways to be relevant to teach them the word of God and teach them how to live. Any questions so far? I'll own it. I'll own it. All right. So let's talk about for a little bit here. Let's talk about the disciples. Can anybody tell me what happened on the mountain when Jesus called them to Galilee to meet on top of the mountain? What's some of the things that took place on the mountain before he set them loose? Not all at once. I'm on a timer because we've got to give them enough time to make back there so y'all don't have to interact. What's well, something that happened? Look at the scripture there. Look at, look at 16 through 20. You'll find your answers right there. Matthew 28, 16 through 20. You'll find answers to this question. What took place on the mountain? They worshiped. They worshiped. What else? Doubted. Some doubted. Some doubted. Okay. What else? Mm, nope. Close. That was part of, the, that part of the command, part of the Great Commission. They didn't get baptized on the mountain. But they were sent, they were told, that's part of what they were told. What else happened on the mountain? 
What are the three things that they were told to do? Teach. What else? One more thing. So we know that they were told to go baptize in the name of who? Oh, it's not the Holy Spirit. They were told to teach. Observe. Observe. They were to go out and make what of all the nations? Disciples. Disciples. Yes. So on the mountain, we had worship going on. We had our doubters, right? So right there, that tells me that you're going to have people in your life that are going to be go along with what's supposed to happen, but you're going to have your doubters. You're going to have that in every church. Every church, you're going to have a group of people that are worshipers, but you're going to have your doubters. It's, it's normal. But there's a way to overcome that. We'll get to that later. Okay? So Jesus told them you're going to go out into all parts of the world and you're going to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Okay? Why would he tell them to do it in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? If you just hold up the number three, you have the answer. Uh, the Holy Spirit? Yes. It's important when we go to make disciples that they understand the Trinity. Okay? I do not believe in the whole Unitarian thing. I don't believe in the whole, this is one. No, it's three in one. Three persons existing in one. Okay? So that's why, that was part of the reason why he wanted them to go and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's important. That Trinity is very, very important. Okay? Now, why would it be important for us to take the word into all parts of the world? As disciples of Christ, why is it important that we take the gospel into all parts of the world? We're going to, I'm going to, two questions here. Why was it important back in their day? And why is it important in our day now? Mm -hmm. Okay. So back then, they didn't have Pathway Press. Back then, they didn't have all these different uh, companies that print Bibles, right? So back then, how did they get the word of God to people? They had to go. Can you imagine in our time today if we didn't have cars, how the gospel would be spread? In this heat, I'm not going far. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to go find me a shade tree and I'm going to hang out over there. And I'm gonna, it's going to be like one of them street corner preachers. I'm going to hang out on the street corner. I'm going to hang out on my shade tree and I'm going to yell the word of God. And when you walk on by, you might be sweating, but you won't hear it, right? All right. So here's the key to this. So how many of us have ever gone out and shared the gospel with random people? Okay? How easy was it? Not always easy. It's not always easy. Was it easy? Uh, I'm sorry. You're oh, yeah, you were in that, you were in that like, like, excited stage. You were on that, like, everybody's going to heaven thing, right? Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah you had that a second ago. Carl, how about for you? Was it easy to go out and share the gospel with random people? Um, it depends on the individual. <laughs> Sometimes you feel like, uh, you got God leads you to talk to this person mm -hmm. maybe that you think, well, that person ain't the very one that you think it's not receptive of it, really. Right. So, for me, now it's real simple. I'll talk to anybody. Y'all know me. I, you know, most of y'all know me. Y'all know I, I don't. It don't bother me. But there was there were times where I felt inadequate because I hadn't got enough of this yet to become relevant. Okay. This is the key right here. This is why I'm not telling everybody in here tonight, because I don't know how far you are in your individual walks with Christ yet. I'm going to learn that. You know how we learn that? We spend time together. Do you know how this, the disciples learned about Jesus? They were with him. In thick, right? So he spent that three and a half years with them. Okay? So they knew each other. Okay? I'm not going to ask y'all to go out there and spark the Bible in Harlem. I'm not going to ask you guys to go door to door and start witnessing for Jesus, okay? The Jehovah's Witnesses messed that up, so we can thank them for that. It's about being prepared. There, I wanted to preach and be a pastor so bad, but I wasn't prepared. When the time came for me to step into the pulpit, the Lord had prepared me. Discipleship is the same way, okay? Jesus prepared his disciples, all right? They walked together, they talked together, they, they, they stayed in the same houses, they stayed in the stables, they stayed out in the you know, middle of nowhere, they ate together, they drank together, they watched him perform miracles. To become a true disciple of Jesus Christ, we've got to do the same thing. We can, we can fellowship with him right in here. 
Okay? We can break bread in here. We can take communion right in here. We can, we can, we can drink with, with Jesus. We can sup with Jesus. We can spend time with Jesus. And if we want to become disciples of Christ, we have to get in here in order to take this out there. Okay? Anybody ever had somebody misquote scripture to you? Yeah, right? Okay, I do it from time to time. Allison gets on me. That's why I've got to stay in here and stay fine too. Stay sharp, okay? Can you lead somebody to Christ if you yourself have not been led to Christ? Why? Why couldn't you lead someone to Christ if you have not been led to Christ? The blind leading the blind. And why would it be the blind leading the blind? Well, the Holy Spirit would draw them or the comforter. Wrong. Right? Yep. You don't have the Holy Spirit? What were you going to say? I don't know. So that Holy Spirit draws you in. I can baptize somebody because of two reasons. I've read about it and I've been baptized myself, so I've experienced it. We all have experienced being led to the Lord, right? How many of us had somebody pray over us when we accepted Jesus Christ? Most everybody? That's the experience that you don't forget, right? That's also an experience that the Lord will use to prepare you to lead somebody else to Christ. And yet the Holy Spirit plays a major role in that. Whether people realize that or not, the Holy Spirit, there's a big piece to being a disciple and leading somebody else to Christ and, and creating a disciple in them. It's that Holy Spirit. But that experience that you have, like Anthony, you can lead somebody to the Lord right now. You may not have read the Bible from cover to cover. And you may not be able to quote scriptures and throw them out and all that kind of stuff like that. But you can lead somebody to Christ because you've had an experience. You've experienced what it's like to, to, to be able to come to Jesus Christ because someone took the time to pray over you and pray with you and lead you to the Lord. That's like that song by um, a Cedar came out. Uh, uh, no, it wasn't Cedar. Lead me to the cross. I love that song. And I, and I constantly think about that. When, when I think about making a disciple, our job is to take this out there so that we can lead them to the cross. So that we can teach them the word of God, so that we can draw, let the Holy Spirit be the drawing in and lead them to the cross so that then they can make the decision whether or not they're going to accept Jesus Christ, right? So because we've had that experience, we can do that, okay? So let's move on a little bit here. How many disciples were on the mountain when Jesus gave the Great Commission? Eleven. What happened to the twelfth? He hung himself. Why? He betrayed. Betrayed Jesus. Okay? So we have 11 disciples that are on the top of the mountain. How many of them doubted? You ever heard, what is it, Doubting Thomas? Never mind, I'll hold on that for another time. Alright, so why did they doubt him? Does anybody know? Does anybody know why they doubted? Why would they doubt? Don, what do you think? Why they doubt? They had trust issues. Okay? Believe it or not, even though Jesus had told them, listen, I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to die. I'm going to give my life for all mankind. But then I'm going to come back. They doubted that it was really him. They had a hard time with it. Okay? Take that as a relevant moment in a spiritual movement. You ever talked about the Bible with somebody? They doubted it? They didn't believe in it? They didn't believe it was true? Why? Why do people not believe the Bible is truth today? Open forum. Why do we think why do we why do we think that? Seeing is believing. Any, are there any logical thinkers in here? You need proof to believe it? Right? Yep. It took you a long time. It took you a long time. And you were an atheist at one point, right? 23 years. 23 years. And now you're filled with the Holy Ghost and, and yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, you can't shake my hair. Yeah. And some people could be like in bondage, you know, not have any confidence that they'll come out of it. So we don't see the joy on the other side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that I think that's that's a big thing right there. The the bondage and not being able to see the joy. Um, I think one of the most difficult things is 
it's it's hard to it's hard to go up to somebody and then you've been there that's that's just in a really bad place and here comes this like bubbly person that's like man Jesus is bringing me I got the joy 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 down in my heart and this other person over here is just having like the worst time of their life and the worst season of their life or worst day of life whatever it may be it's hard to say look my Bible tells me that Jesus came so that I can have life a life more abundant my Bible tells me that Jesus came so that I could experience joy so that I can experience, the Holy Spirit was sent so that I can experience peace. It's hard to go up to somebody who's in the worst part of their life and tell them these things and get them to fully buy in. Now, how do we get them to fully buy in? You said it. How do we get them to fully buy into it and believe it? We trust in who? The Holy Spirit. We trust in the Holy Spirit, okay? The Holy Spirit, as y'all fan, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm not, hey, look, I'm not hot. Y'all wonder why I'm standing right here? I got an air vent. Y'all like to come right up here and use my air vent if you can? Um, um, I promise I'll put that thing back on the timer. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind when we go out and we want to like share the gospel real fast, right? Have you ever been so excited to share the gospel that you just didn't even, like you had tunnel vision and you couldn't see anything else going on? I've seen people do that before. Okay? This is how I'm going to share the gospel with you. I'm going to be calm, cool, collected. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to share it with you. Because there's something that, that we have to be very careful of as disciples, okay? You ever, uh, you ever heard of technology overload? Information overload? Okay. If I sit here tonight and I try to tell you 55 different things about the Bible, it's going to be overload, isn't it? Okay, we're talking about discipleship, so I'm going to do my absolute best and stay on my notes and talk through discipleship. But if I start talking about the resurrection over here and I start talking about how God created this in the book of Genesis and on this day he rested and then he created Adam and then he had to make him sleep. And then I'll move over into Ezekiel and how Babylonians always took them in captivity. It would be overloaded, wouldn't it? Right? Then it's like, oh, what did you say? Like, I'm already overloaded here. So, here's the thing. This is where, as Carlton said, the Holy Spirit is super, super, super important. Okay? We just had the day of Pentecost this past Sunday. That was the birthing of the church, the first century church. Here's why the Holy Spirit is so important. Okay? There is nothing wrong as disciples of Christ to get super excited. But you've got to use discernment from the Holy Spirit. Okay? Can anybody tell me what discernment is? Is it when you understand something? When you understand what it means? Kind of. Allison, what's discernment? Wisdom. Wisdom? What else? Knowing anybody else? Knowing when to trust or what to trust. No one to trust, no one to trust. Right. So discernment, it's the Holy Spirit that's giving you wisdom and knowledge and understanding that's beyond your own. Okay? That's discernment. Okay? That's like the Lord might tell you, Christina, don't go down this road, go down this road. Or Crystal, don't take this job, wait for this job here. Or Anthony, keep on your path because I've got blessing here as long as you don't go here. Right? That's what discernment is. Discernment is that, that, that wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that surpasses our own mind, right? In my mind, I can understand things. But with the discernment from the Holy Spirit, I can get insight into things that I can't or won't see in my own thinking, right? The Bible tells us not by our own understanding, but by His, right? So, that's where the discernment, and this is very important about being disciples, because this is where, it, this will come into play and tell you sometimes, okay, keep going, or stop where you are. It sometimes is it's so, sometimes people are fickle, right? Sometimes it's hard to like, say, okay, this person is, he's ready for this, or, or she's not ready for this, or she's ready for that, or he's not ready for this. This is where discernment from the Holy Spirit comes into play as disciples of Christ. It tells us when to pump the brakes, and it tells us when to put our foot on the gas. Okay? 
This is why it is so important. This is why the Holy Spirit is talked about over and over and over again. This is why one of the reasons the Lord sent the Holy Spirit. It gives us a deeper spiritual understanding into being disciples of Christ. Okay? We can push and push and push and push and push. All we want. Anybody got somebody in your family you've been praying for for a long time? And they just still haven't fell off the cliff in Jesus' arms yet? Yeah. But we keep going, don't we? But we don't push, do we? I'm not going to bring Christina up here and shove her off the stage and say, I hope you make it. I mean, I know it's not real far, but I'm not going to do that because I think I can push her hard enough that she hit that floor. I'm not going to do that. I'm, the reason I'm talking about this is I know that there have been people in my life that I remember, man, uh, Dale, holy cow. Um, the, I'm sorry, in another church. I was praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I was I was knelt down at an altar, okay? And this is a this is a, a testament of being too too pushy. Okay? I'm knelt down at an altar and I'm like on the verge of like the Holy Spirit. Like it's moving, it's happening, people are getting I think a couple other people got filled with it that night, and, and that person comes and puts their knee right in the middle of my back. I can't breathe. And I'm sitting here trying to pray. And this person had like they like it's like they've got me like pinned down. I'm like on the altar like this, and I'm a big old boy. But you put your, your knee in the back of you know, and it just it don't work and it messed it up. Okay, I could not focus. So why did I tell you that? Don't be like that when you're trying to lead people to Christ. Know the limits. Know the boundaries. Know when to take a step and put your hand on somebody and begin to pray, and know when to pray from a distance. Okay. There are some people that I know right now that I can only pray for them from a distance because they're not ready for me to come all the way in and lay my hands on them and lead them to Jesus. There are people that believe in Jesus that still want you to stay at a distance, and that's okay. As long as we understand that and let the discernment, let the leading of the Holy Spirit guide us through that, we will be more, it's not about being successful, so I don't want to say we will be more successful <clears throat> But we will be further in tune with God's will for our life and for that person's life. Okay. Questions, comments, concerns, emotional outbursts? I have a comment. Comment, yes ma'am. So I know it's hot. No. <laughs> when, when we are like discipling to other people, I find it's so much easier for me to talk with people who have gone through the same, the same experiences that I have or who have been in a place that I used to be in. When you get around uh, people who are walking through something that you have walked through yourself, you're on common ground with them, and you can tell them, like, listen, I've been there. I know what you're feeling right now because I've walked through this myself, and look at what Jesus has done. You know, it's just, it's so much easier to identify with people who are going through the same thing. And it's just easier to disciple that way, you know, versus, yeah. you know, it's like. It, it is, it is. And, you know, that's something. I'll never be able to minister to people the way that you can. Because I haven't walked in your shoes. I haven't lived your life. I haven't been through. Now, I could have gone through the same things you went through. Very similar. But I haven't. And so, that's, I think that's important. And I think that's something that the church in the 21st century is missing. On the, that's a big, big piece that's missing today. Every one of us has been through something in life that someone else hasn't, right? Okay? I am not a woman. I have never been through childbirth. And I don't want to go through childbirth. If God said switching, that's it. No more people. I've done it. That's it. You have been down roads that I've never been down. I don't want to go down through those. But I'm but and I don't want to say, don't think that I'm saying that that you're you're less of a person or anything. But there's a reason that everything it, it's easy for you to minister to that, like you said. It's easy for you to minister to a group of people because you can relate to them. Bucky, my mentor. He can relate to drug addicts and crack kids and, and crack dealers and, and meth cooks. He can relate and alcoholics. He can relate to them a whole lot better than I can because he lived that life. I can relate to people. Uh, yeah, you should be an athlete. I can really relate to people like that because I've lived that life. I've been through that life. And I mean, there's other things that I can you know relate to people with. But we don't, as disciples of Christ, it's so important that we take that. And I'm glad you said that because that, that really... That's a huge piece right there. It, when you're comfortable with a group of people, like Linda can bake. She can bake. She can, she can, it's, it's awesome. Wait till one of these days she makes her gooey bars and you, that's all I'll eat today. <laughs> but 
She can reach people through baking where I can't. I can bake out of a box. That's it, right? Linda can bake from scratch. Anthony can, can do barbecue. I can flip a switch. I, I, can't, I can't barbecue like he does. You know, everybody has different things. Everybody has, like, like Don and Maya. They're like bodybuilders. They're, they're like, yeah, he's like, I got this, Mr. Atlas. <laughs> I can relate to that a little bit, but I can't fully relate to it because when I used to work out, it wasn't to be like physically fit for like bodybuilding. It was to be strong for playing sports. So there's different things that we've been through in our life. Like Anthony, he can take apart an a, a engine and put it all back together with his eyes shut probably. I can't do that. He's not going to sit there and say, hey, man, help me take this engine apart. He might teach me, but he's not going to me, just come help me because he's going to walk me through everything. You see what I'm saying? You take the experiences in your life and what you have been through and what you have gone through and the knowledge that you have gained from the Holy Spirit, from what you've experienced, and then you relate it to other people. Okay? I can relate to people that used to have a drinking problem because I used to have one. I can't relate to that. I know what that's like. As far as addiction goes, that's as far as I can go with that. I can't go into the drug side of the addiction and things that other people can. I can try, but it's like, I lived in Alaska and you guys didn't. I can tell you about it all day long, but until you go there, you won't fully understand it, right? That's how this is. When we, that's why each one of the disciples had different characteristics and attributes, and God or Jesus picked them that way for a reason. Because he knew that there was going to come that day where they would get sent out and they would reach those people. Just like Allison was a teacher. That was a call, that's a calling. Linda was a teacher. That's a calling. You're called to use the experiences that you have to make things relevant to people to educate them, right? That's what this is for, okay? When I first became a pastor, I had no experience about being a pastor. I've had to learn. But there were things that people could relate to me and that they could tell me about that when I experienced them, that all the pieces fell together and connected. I can talk to people now. I can talk to young guys that want to become pastors now and tell them, you better think again and go run somewhere else. Just, you better go have a Jonah experience so you know, because it's not easy. It's, it's hard. And sometimes you get a pastor that forgets to turn the air on and everybody has to fan themselves, you know, so that's why I tell you know. But we can take our experiences in life and we can become relevant to it. And that's why this is so important. There's things in here that I'm going to read that I can relate to my life that maybe you don't see. There's going to be things that you might read that I don't see. And that's how it is for every one of us. It's going to be things that the Lord shows us that we can use to relate to other people. Questions, comments, concerns, emotional outbursts there before we move on. Yeah, I like the way God puts people in each other's paths. So they can relate. They have a common denominator. But also when someone's filled with the Holy Spirit, a preacher's preaching, he can be anywhere with any group and, and touch somebody because, I mean, sometimes someone might be sitting in church and, you know, he might look over at his wife and say, did she tell him about me? Because he's, <laughs> he's hit stuff. He's stepping on it. And that's the Holy Spirit. Knows where that person's right. at. And uh, it, it just works every kind of way. God can work so many different paths, so many different ways. But it is wonderful how God will put someone that has the same problem with someone else. It's not a coincidence that they're, they're together. That's right. And that's why I think, you know, a lot of churches, and not to pick on you, so don't think this, but a lot of churches wouldn't let her do things because of her past. But look what God's doing. God's using her. And there's a, and, and, and I think this, there's a key to this. We're, we'll, we'll never be perfect, okay? Every one of us has a past, everyone has a history. But if God can get one, just one, and turn them, turn them away from what they are over here because he only sees what they'll be over here, then he can take that one and now go find a whole bunch of more. He can find 99 more with that one. Because now that one, and I'm not saying you're a shepherd, but now you can go and find those that are just like what you were at one point, and now you can walk them back over here because now you know the road to get to Jesus, and you can walk them 
to Jesus. Anybody in here really good with like you go somewhere once and you can find it again without directions? Oh man, I'm good at that. Like I'm, I, I, it's just, I don't know, I guess it's a blessing. Allison finds it barely with GPS, but I can go somewhere but one time. I remember the first time I ever went to visit her in Cleveland, Tennessee. I needed to, that's this is back when MapQuest existed. You know, MapQuest. Everybody remember that? Yeah, back in like it was eight, seven, six, I don't know, six. I went there one time. And that was it. I never needed directions again. I can go one time somewhere and I don't really, I just don't need directions because I see things on the route. Like there, I know it, I know that when I get down to Rims and I turn on, I think it's 278, 36 miles is a gas station. It's on the hill on the right hand side, a little bitty convenience store, mom and pop convenience store. Have really good little hot dogs in there. Okay, I know that. I know about 45 miles past that, I'm going to be getting on the outskirts of Macon or something like that. So I know as I go down these routes, I, there's things that I can look for. I'm also just good with direction and know that, okay, my goal is to get over here and I'm going to get there somehow. Allison, not so much. But that's okay. That's why I do most of the driving. But because we have all walked our road and we know that road, like you could walk around your property, couldn't you? And know with your eyes, much your eyes closed, you know your property, right? That's your property. You're familiar with it. You know where things are. That's exactly how it is with the Word of God and being disciples. We walk through things. So the Bible tells us that the Word of God is a lamp unto our feet. It's lighting our steps, okay? Our next step. So because we are called to be disciples of Christ, and because we have walked a certain path, we know that path. And we know that even if we're walking on a path that, that leads to destruction, we still know that path, right? We still know every step of that path. But eventually there's going to come that moment where we encounter Jesus and the Holy Spirit comes down. And now we can stop on that path. We have a new path to get to Jesus. And now we know that we can bring people on our path and we know where to turn to get them to Jesus. That's what he's doing with you. You've been through things. He, and he'll do that with anybody. He'll do that for everybody. There's things that we can go through that he'll tell us when the time is right to take the turn on the road and get off the road. Because do you remember the day that he called you off that road? You remember the exact day, don't you? Do you remember where you were? Yeah, okay. Those are things we don't forget. I know that if I get on I-20 and I'm going to Little Robins, I'm going to get exit 130 and I'm hanging on the left. I know that. I've been there enough times. I also know that I can get there through Renz and go down through, I think it's 278. I know how to get to my destinations because I've been down those roads. I'll never forget. It was January 12, 2012, when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It was about 9, 9.45 in the morning. I was knelt down at our teeny weeny love seat couch. It was like the size of this pulpit. I'll never forget that moment. There's things that we don't forget. Those are our spiritual road markers. Now, even when he shows us where to turn sometimes, you may have made a wrong turn. Yeah, it happens, okay? Sometimes... How many men do the driving with your, with your, you know, significant others in the car? Do they sit there quietly? Maya's like, I'm just going to turn my head on this one. But do they sit there quiet? How many men, how many times do you miss a turn because somebody in the passenger seat was talking? One out of five. Too many to count, praise the Lord. That's what happens as disciples of Christ. We're on our path. And the devil is over here trying to sidetrack us, okay? Well, I guess we'll, we'll jump into this part here, okay? When we, are when we are discipling, okay, and I'm watching my clock because I've got to make sure I give them enough time to bake. Y'all got another 12 minutes in to follow me here? Y'all got me? Okay, 12 more minutes. 12 more minutes. If y'all want to go stand by air vents, it's okay. They all work. You should have one right back there. Just open that vent. There's like a cover back there somewhere. You just open that whole vent. I might just take the cover off this one. It is. Just know that something might crawl out of it. Just be careful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, listen to this, okay? John chapter 9, verse 4 says, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work, okay? This is very, very important. This is Jesus talking to his disciples and letting them know there's coming a day, like now is the time to do the work. There's coming a day where we won't get to work, okay? So now I want us to kind of shift gears a little bit and understand where we are in time, okay? Anybody know what time it is right now? 751. 7.51, okay? Do we know when the end of the world's coming? Anybody? 
No? Yeah. If it is that, praise the Lord, we all go together. That's okay. Right? I hope don't nobody get left in here. If you do, it's gonna be hot here. So <laughs> hey, just preparation for later on. Okay? You thought it already happened in the world? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. 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 That's like we had Y2K and then there was that guy that like sold like all of it. He sold his house and everything and bought like the RV to drive around the world. Right there should have been a sign that he was going to drive around the world in his RV. So that, that was number one on the list there. Anyways, as disciples of Christ, should we wait till tomorrow to read this and pray for an opportunity to inter interact with somebody that's never heard it? Nope. Why? Might miss it. Might miss it. There's a reason John 9 and 4 is so important. If Jesus told the disciples... I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. There's a reason Jesus told them that. Because they don't they didn't know if he was gonna have the second coming before they 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 you know they didn't know. They didn't know if like 30 years down the road he'd come back again and that would be it. So what he did right there is he instilled a value into his disciples, okay? What value was it that he instilled in them in that scripture? You might tell me. John 9, 4 and 4. No, John 9 and 4. See, you got me, you, you messed me up telling me I need to say the, the thing slower and I'm bad about saying 9, 4, 9, 4, 9, 4, move on. John chapter 9, verse 4. Don, will you fill that one back up here for me? Should be number two on the list. In theory. John chapter 9, verse 4. Hold on, I'll give you a page number. You need a page number. Give Anthony a page number here. Anthony, that's going to be on page. the CSB Tony Evans Bible page 1242. What did Jesus instill in the disciples from this scripture? The urgency to uh, go and get it done because while, uh, while the crop's there, you got to get it. Yeah. I like how you said that. Get it done. In this scripture here, okay? In this scripture, Jesus is instilling work ethic in the disciples. Okay? How many of your supervisors are hired in here? Okay? What is your job as a supervisor? To manage people. Why do you have to manage people? They don't know what they're doing. Yep. Amen. Hallelujah. Makes me want to shout new part of this. Jesus needed to instill in them a work ethic. Because remember, right here, we're only nine chapters into the book of John. Jesus isn't crucified. They haven't even found out, found out yet that he's going to be crucified for another, oh, let's see here. That's chapter 9. I think right around, right around chapter 15 or 16, they, they start finding out that, uh, that I, think, yeah, I think it's chapter 16, they start talking, he starts talking about what's going to happen. So, he's, how many of you know what front-loading is? You ever front-load people? Okay, so front-loading people, Allison taught me how to do this. She, she's really good at this. So if Allison ever tells you something really, really nice, just know that something really, really tough is coming behind her, and she's going to give you something really nice again, okay? So I'm just kidding. Front-loading somebody is preparing somebody for something, okay? And my job with T-Mobile, it's my job to teach and coach the reps that I work with that when they put a customer in as a business lead to get set up with an account executive, they need to prepare the customer and let them know you are going to get a phone call in the next 24 to 48 hours from a phone number that you don't know. Okay? How many of you in here answer phone calls and phone numbers you don't know? I do when I want to mess with people and then I just hang up on them. Anyways, it's my job to coach them and help prepare them to front load their customers 
so that that customer just doesn't reject that call because they don't know who it is. Jesus was front-loading the disciples for what he was going to tell them in the Great Commission. Can you see it? He's preparing them for work ethic here and letting them know he's managing them like Anthony was talking about. He's managing the disciples and preparing them for what he's going to tell them on the mountain of Galilee. Right here in verse 9, he tells them, you got to work. You better work. You better get it done. Because if you don't get it done, the crop is going to be gone. The opportunity is going to be missed. There are people, I, I believe that there are people that God has chosen for us to witness to in our lives. There are specific people that he have, that He will have us encounter and go after. It's like sometimes I used to wonder, God, why in the world did you give me this job? Why did I do this job over here? There were people that God wanted me to interact with over here. And then sometimes I think, why in the world did you bring me over here to do this? There's people that God wants you to interact with over here. I'll share this with you because this is, this is, I couldn't understand this one for a while, but I finally fully understood it by the time we moved home. Dr. George Morris, who's in the Hall of Prophets uh, with uh, Lee University and the Church of God. That's a big, big honor. It's a big deal. That man is Holy Ghost filled through and through. He used to tell me, son, the best thing that we can do is help you move out of Alaska so that you can minister to more people. I didn't understand that at the time because I thought, well, there's 3,500 people here in, in Alaska. In this village, I can minister to these 3,500. There might be a few thousand in the other villages. Okay, so maybe six, seven thousand 7,000 people. Well, when I started working for Sprint, I'd see four, five, six thousand people a month. And it made sense. What he was telling me at the time, I didn't understand. It wasn't until I experienced it that then it made sense. It became relevant, right? There it is right there. At the time, they didn't fully understand that. They didn't catch on to that. The reason I believe that is because they would argue with Jesus about things that he wanted to do. They would, well, why are you going up? Jesus, no, nope, I'm going up here. And he never, and oh man, oh, the Lord just showed me something. Thank you. I, I, yeah, now I know all the reason why I told you. Jesus didn't reason with the disciples when he was going to do something. He just went and did it. They better follow him, right? Oh man, that's going to kind of look like a new level of parenting. Don't you roll your eyes at me. So we see that Jesus was front-loading the disciples here. He was preparing them for the Great Commission. How do we front-load non-believers? Anybody? We got like three minutes left. Tell the good news first. Okay. What's the good news? That you can be saved. Okay. Are you going to go up to somebody and say, look, there's an opportunity for you to no longer be a dirty, wretched sinner anymore. Just accept Jesus. You're going to front load them like, please don't. And don't say my pastor said to do this either. I will disown you. <laughs> well, how, so when we go and we front load non-believers, we tell them the good news, right? Why? There's two reasons here. Why should we tell them the good news? that come from? From the magnifying section? Praise the Lord. Okay? I love you, Lily. Just know that. To spread the word? Yep, to spread the word. And what else? The Bible talks about that no man should perish. Right? It's great to spread the good news because it fulfills a command. Does everybody deserve a chance to know Jesus Christ before they die? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a big part of being a disciple. That's a real big part. I remember. I remember. I used to be concerned with what I would preach because I was concerned with whether people would like it or not. And I'm not. This is not ugly. Don't take this ugly. I don't care what you think. And that's not to boast. Because I know that like Carl said, that discernment, when the Lord leads you to say something or guides you to something, it's not about, is, have, how many of you read the Bible from cover to cover? All right, homework. Before next Wednesday night, knock it out. All right, just, you know, several hours a day. Allie, you got it, right? 
Genesis 1 and Revelation 22. You got it? All right, you got it covered. She's got it. She's going to give us a synopsis next week. You got this. When the Lord leads me to speak on something, He's not concerned whether or not it's going to hurt your feelings, or it's going to make you feel good, or it's going to get you excited. He's not worried about that, okay? And there's the time. Maya, will you see if they're ready for dessert? Please, ma'am. If you don't mind, you just walk right through there. It's fine. Sometimes, anybody ever had somebody tell you a real hard truth and you like it? Anybody ever step on your toes and you're just like, man, that kind of hurt? All right? I'm going to say this. And don't go out there trying to hurt people's feelings to bring them to Christ. Don't you do that. Please don't. There are things in here that are hard to swallow. Okay? Real hard to swallow. But when it's, when it's given... From love and mercy and grace, it's not hard to swallow. There's been things in here that I've read before that it was, it was, I was like, hmm, that hurts. That stings. Because that was the Lord taking things off of me that didn't need to be there, right? Five more minutes. All right. You've got to be rejected by people when you talk about God. You gotta be looked at. Anybody get looked at real funny at, at work? Yeah. I used to have people that make fun of me. Oh, here comes that preacher again. That's right. I work here. You're gonna hear about it. You may not like it, but you're gonna hear about it. But I want you to know that as disciples of Christ, okay, when the anointing of the Holy Spirit rests upon your shoulders and Jesus is in your heart and God is your guiding focus. It doesn't matter how bad people talk about you. It doesn't matter what people don't like about what you say. It doesn't, none of that matters. Because what happens is, you think a farmer cares when he goes and tills his ground if the ground likes it, it, like being dug up? Nope, he didn't care about that. He doesn't care about that because his job is to go and plant that seed by any means necessary, right? That's what Jesus was telling the disciples. By any means necessary, Get my word to my people. Please don't go Jehovah Witness style on people and just go crazy and just go be knocking on people's doors. Don't do that. Okay? Please don't do that. But get it in your mind and in your heart that by any means necessary, when the Lord opens the door, you share the gospel. You love sharing the gospel with people, don't you? Crystal, I, I got a kick happen today that when you sent me that picture down there in uh, Charleston, wasn't it? You sent me that picture. That's right, it's in Augusta, yeah. yeah he was preaching on the, uh, oh, where was it? He was preaching. Uh, it was just an old man. He was right in front of my store and he literally did not have a shirt on and he had a Bible and he was yelling and screaming. Yep. the word and everybody was looking at him and my staff even came and went out there in the store and he had a shirt on and was yelling. And I went out there and I saw him with the Bible and preaching the word and like, He's not bothering anybody, so follow me. Moving on. Yep. <laughs> that same day I was in Bon Austin, there was literally a guy uh, in the uh, common area there in front of the mall. There's like a, a common area. And he was out there singing worship songs. And people were walking by, some people stopped, and you know, I was like, hey, I know that song. And they answered. Sometimes that's what it takes. Y'all know I don't mind standing out and drawing attention. Because I want God to get attention. So if we get it in our heart, we get it in our mind, that by any means necessary, and I'm not saying that we're not going to take a shirt off and start like preaching. Man, don't do that, please. If you do, it's between you and God. The Bible tells us to be ready in season and out of season. That means to be ready at all times. Right? And if we're ready at all times, then we can fulfill two things, John 9 and 4. Work while it's still day, and we can fulfill the great commission that we talked about in Matthew 28, 16 through 20. All that to say this, if you read your word of God, you can be a disciple of Christ. If you pray and seek the Lord and accept Jesus, you can be a disciple of Christ. You can be a prepared one. 
If you're not reading your word, you're not praying, but you've accepted Jesus Christ, you're a disciple in training. Because God's not going to go let you run out there and just start witnessing the people on the mission. You might encounter somebody and say, hey man, I got saved. You know, you talk about that. And he's not going to send you out and have you quote in scripture. But you'll have people looking at you like, what is this guy talking about here? But that's okay too. Because when the Lord knows you're ready, he's going to let you loose and he's going to cut you loose. Okay? Questions, comments, concerns, emotional outbursts, rebuttals to discipleship one-on-one. I don't think anybody should be ashamed to share what the Lord has done for them. And same with like, you know, some people worship and pray differently. Mm-hmm. Like me, I don't care what people think. They might be like, oh my gosh, you know, they go crazy, whatever. But I don't care because you don't know. I've had an encounter with Jesus, not just an experience. I've had an encounter with okay. him. You know, so I don't care what people think because I don't care. I don't care what people think about me. I care about what God knows about me, you know. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, that's like, you guys, have you guys ever noticed that when I leave worship, I don't look at anybody? Have y'all ever picked up on that? There's a reason. Not that I don't want to look at you guys and you guys aren't pretty and handsome and stuff like that. I don't want anybody to distract me from my encounter with God. That's just that's just it. It's not that I don't want to see people, but I don't want to see somebody standing out there. I mean, there's been time. How many of you ever stood in worship like this? And it's like, all right, hurry up, sing through it, hurry up. Yeah, we sang this song three weeks ago. Okay. Yeah, getting through it. I used to be like that. I used to be like that. When I was going to church because I wanted to date her. Yeah, man. How much longer this worship song? How many times are you gonna sing the chorus? Quit going to the bridge. But she said something there that's really important an encounter. I can sit here and talk about my encounters all day long. And everybody has to have their own encounter with God. Everybody has to have their own. You can share from events and, and things that you've encountered with God and set a foundation and a base for them, but they've got to experience it for their own too. Okay? You, I, I love the way you worship up here because you've been broken and you realize that you probably end up in the grave if you kept on with you. Yeah. So there's a level of like thankfulness that you have that a lot of people don't because they've never been that far broken. And not to say that everybody can't worship that way. I, I don't care what I look like when I worship. I, I don't. If I wasn't up here holding on to a guitar, I'd be. And even, and even with the guitar, I can, I can still let loose and I can worship how I see fit. But we should never hold back on our worship. Like, it's really cool to see everybody like come together to worship and sing. I can't wait for the kids to leave worship this Sunday morning. They're going to leave holy water this Sunday morning. That's going to be. I can't wait. It's going to be so exciting. I might even play the piano for that song. I don't know. I can play the piano. Good job. Mm-hmm. I've been practicing. Anything else to be shared tonight with discipleship? Well, I like the way uh, the potter and the clay story. Uh, the clay that comes out of the deepest pit is the best. The, the potter makes it the best. I mean, it's the best clay. Yep. Yeah, because it's, it's rich in nutrients. It's it's got moisture. It's got the right type of moisture and just just the right level of moisture. It's it's the most uh, was it pliable, malleable. Yeah. Teachers, malleable, pliable, movable. Yeah, yeah. Which is movable. But you're right. It's it's that's the that's the best because everybody knows that clay on top is what hard. Yeah. But the further you go, it's it's softer, right? Yeah. Have you ever seen glass? Y'all remember the movie uh, Sweet Home Alabama? Where the lightning hits the rod and makes the glass? What is that sand before it becomes glass? Salt. Right? It's easier to take something when, I look at this, when you've been broken, you have no strength to hold yourself up. Okay? You have no strength to hold yourself up. So then you become movable and shapeable. Because you have no strength left of your own. So now you're in this state where you're at the bottom of this, this, this clay pit and God scoops you up. And as he scoops you up and he's bringing you up, he's shaping you to prepare you to put you on the wheel. Because when he scoops you up, you're just, you're a glob, right? Just a ball of mess. And then he kind of, you know, he doesn't do a whole lot of shaping up as you're coming up. But he shapes you up some and he puts you right on top of the potter's wheel. And he sits you in the right position and now you're ready. 
So I'm glad you said that. That's a, that's a, that's a good point. Thank you for sharing that. Anything else? All good? Praise the Lord. Carl, will you dismiss us in prayer so we can go enjoy our dessert? Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this message. We thank you for this service. We thank you for each and every one that's in us, Father God. We just ask that your Holy Spirit just lead, guide, and direct each of us, Father God. Help us to say what you want us to say. Help us to be bold, Father God. And help us to do your will, Father God. And just touch each and every one, Father God, here tonight. Put a hedge about them and keep them safe, Father God. And bless them. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. We can venture over to the Anchor Island.